Sister Simone Campbell is the executive director of Network, a lobby for Catholic social justice, uh, an advocacy organization founded by Catholic sisters based here in Washington, D.C. She has led six cross-country nuns on the bus trips focused on tax justice, healthcare, economic justice. <laughs> for the nuns on the bus, all right. Comprehensive immigration reform, voter turnout, bridging divides in politics, and mending the gaps. Sister Simone Campbell wrote the famous nuns letter, considered by many as critically important in convincing Congress uh, to support the Affordable Care Act in 2010. She's also author of a book, A Nun on the Bus, How All of Us Can Help Create Hope, Change, and Community. And copies of that, of course, are available if you're interested afterwards. She has received numerous awards for her work through the years. Uh, she was um, honored and asked to speak at the Democratic National Convention 2012. You probably heard her or were watching on television when she spoke. Uh, she's appeared on 60 Minutes, uh, The Colbert Report, and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. That must have been fun, right? I hope it was. Uh, she is a well-known religious leader for her work. Um, she and her colleagues at Network have been a presence in this town for uh, more than 30 years. Um, and she is also an attorney uh, and a poet, which some people don't know about Sister Simone. And of course, she has extensive experience in public policy and in particularly uh, advocating for systemic change on behalf of the poor and the dispossessed. I'm happy to present Sister Simone Campbell. Well, I have to say it's intimidating following the story of Dorothy Day. I feel like a mild-mannered reporter, um, not caught up in the amazing commitment and awareness of spirituality vibrating in her very being. And I think what struck me as I watched the film was to realize how spirituality has consequences. Faith leads us to action. And don't you find that often we kind of hold back? I don't want to be too faithful. I don't want to get too far into this. There might be something demanded of me, help. And what I see in this film is her amazing consistency to integrity, to following the lead of a spirit that draws her forward regardless of other people's reaction around her. Now we have some Catholic worker people here in in the audience, so I need to acknowledge you all and to say that the Catholic worker is a vocation of uh, intensity. A couple of our sisters lived in Catholic worker houses before coming to our community. And when they got to community, they said, oh, well, this is a lot easier than the Catholic worker. I mean, join the convent, have it easy. But what we've learned together over the years is how the commitment to radical hospitality opens us to receive the poor, the marginalized, those who are most left out. But as I was watching the film, I was thinking, hmm, who's to, who today do we need to radically receive? And it got me thinking that, you know, there's a house, a kind of a large house, White House, just down the street. And it made me think, how do we practice a radical hospitality when we're so rigidly divided in our individualism? 
How do we find a way to love beyond the boundaries of my own personal opinion? Now, for me, that requires a deep faith and a spiritual practice that opens us to that deeper truth. And I like to say that, I mean, this is one, a little spiritual insight that I had a few years ago, but it, it applies here. When I saw those pictures of serving the soup in the soup lines, if we really know we are one in the body of Christ, then we know we're serving each other in that action. We're serving God. And how hard I work to stifle my imagination so I don't have those thoughts because those thoughts have consequences. And I like an orderly existence. I like lobbying on Capitol Hill. I like going on a bus. I like having it contained. But I think what Dorothy Day teaches us is fidelity is not necessarily contained in the popular, in the well-liked, or in the predictability of one's existence. So I'm, uh, I understand from Martin, I'm one of the few folks that think Dorothy Day should not be canonized. I think she shouldn't be canonized, not because she wasn't a saint. I think she shouldn't be canonized because a number of those folks on the screen that wanted to advocate for that really want to tame her. They want to set her apart. Jim Wallace said it well, you know, she'd never want to be called a saint. But they want to set her apart and on a pedestal and we can say, oh, wow, she was a saint. Well, that explains everything. When really what I think Dorothy Day is about is challenging us to stir up our lives, to open our hearts to a radical acceptance and love for all those that we would even want to leave out. And I have to confess, it's easier for me sometimes to respond to the very poor, marginalized, the homeless, than to certain politicians. And what I know, though, from my faith, is that we're called to receive them all, even when I disagree with them. So what I bring from this film, and I'm so grateful for it, is that what Pope Francis says in his exhortation on holiness really applies in Dorothy Day's life. Pope Francis says that there are five characteristics of holiness in the 21st century. And while Dorothy Day died in the 20th, I think she was a precursor of this. When she, oh wait, wait I have to tell you just one story though, that uh, makes, but Pope Francis makes me think of this. It was great to see him speaking in Congress. And um, afterwards, I was speaking with a, I was in the chambers. I got to be in the chambers when the Pope spoke. And uh, afterwards, I was speaking with a, a reporter, and he didn't quite hear rightly. He says, well, well why was the Pope talking about Doris Day? <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 you missed a basic here. You missed a basic. But what Pope Francis says are these characteristics of holiness are first that there's perseverance. And Dorothy Day persevered in her quest for this sense of the holy, the sense of sacred in a prayer life. I do an hour prayer in the morning. I heard in there three hours a day. Ooh, hmm, I could learn something. Perseverance. The second, he says, is joy and a sense of humor. And did you hear joy and the references to that sense of party and being together and welcoming? Of course, I did like the pre-conversion uh, pre moments in the bar. That looked, that looked quite good. But I think it carried over into Catholic worker reality in the joy that I've seen in Catholic worker places. The third, he says, is passion and boldness. And Pope Francis says that we're often 
tempted just to pull back and to not really put out what we know or what we see. And didn't we see in this film that call to radically be who we're called to be? The fourth, he says, is to do whatever we do in community. Tonight, community, the Catholic worker houses, all of the alums, all of the folks that have passed through Catholic Worker create community because we know we belong to each other. Isn't that the holiness that Dorothy Day calls forth? And finally, Pope Francis says, the fifth characteristic is to live in constant prayer. And isn't that what we saw? Her constant sense of the presence of the divine and the effort to live a gospel message in a really complicated world. So I don't know about you, but I feel challenged. I feel stirred up. I feel one with a woman who some want to call a saint, but I prefer to call her the troublemaker. Thank you. Up. So thank, thank you. Thank you all for staying too this evening to have a little conversation with this version of the troublemaker, <laughs> Sister Simone. Um, I was going to ask you, um, you spend most of your life um, confronting Congress, Capitol Hill, gauging politics, and as much as I know you admire Dorothy Day, everybody asks me now as I travel around the country, what surprised you in making the film, Martin? And one of the first things that I have to admit is that after having campaigned for the right for women to vote, after having been arrested and put in jail and beaten for the right to, for women to vote, Dorothy Day never voted. And, right. And how can... <laughs> and, and when I've asked the granddaughters and everybody associated with Dorothy Day's legacy, there's no real comfortable explanation. They just said, well... She just never did. We think maybe it's possible she actually voted in local elections, but certainly never in national elections. And how can you be a really good anarchist and then still vote for the system? And it went back and forth like that. But she's still, a, you know, to her, to her dying day, she never voted. How do, you, how do you rationalize that? How do you deal with that one? Um, well, I'm grateful that she's not in the 2020 election cycle where we need everyone to vote. <laughs> But um, I, I think the, the consistency that I see in that is that she didn't pay federal taxes and did not want to be engaged in a federal system. And so for her, her line appears to be uh, the national control piece. And so she wouldn't want to be compromised as a part of that because my hunch is uh, her candidates wouldn't win. And so... And maybe she was just a sore loser and didn't want to open herself to that. I don't know. But the, the, the fact that she very consistently found that the federal policy was unacceptable to the Christian teaching and to what's going on. And some of my Catholic worker friends say, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. So we have folks here. Would you folks who are associated with the Catholic worker house here in Washington, D.C., would you stand up for a second so we can... Honor yeah, you for a minute. On, come guys. on, Kathy. There you are. They, these, these troublemakers over here have inherited all of her uh, grace and genius and hospitality and have, so afterwards, go talk to them because they're the most interesting folks in the house. One, one of the things I really wanted to try and bring out in the film, and uh, because it really struck me, uh, is this notion of personalism. Mm -hmm. And I, if you notice, I tried my best to wrap it throughout the course of the film because I was very moved about the whole notion of personalism. And I, I speak on a lot of college campuses and universities and seminaries, and there can be a sense, especially with young people, that the, the challenges are so overwhelming. They just get exhausted at all the things that have to be fixed and corrected. 
all the systems that are sort of malfunctioning for them. And the whole notion to me of personalism says you don't have to fix everything. But what you're responsible for, what God calls you to do, is to help the person who's right there next to you. And I wrap that in again and again and again throughout the film because I think ultimately that's what she stood for. It wasn't a big systems fix. It was saying that this is the poor person on the street next to me. I have to take care of them. Don't tell them, go be thou filled. We have to take care of them. That's our job. And in some ways, I find that incredibly liberating, the notion that I don't have to feel burdened by all the big systems problems, but I, all I'm called to do is to help that one person who's right there in front of me, and I can do that. I feel, I feel empowered then to do that. Right, and isn't part of that whole discernment to know what part of the body of Christ am I? What am I called to do? And, and some, I mean, like for Dorothy Day, clearly was in that moment serving in that way. But I don't serve in a soup kitchen, but I think I'm playing a part in the body of Christ. But I don't feel overwhelmed with, you know, all of the horrors going on in our world because I'm just doing my part. So if I have a strong sense of community, if I have a strong sense of the body of Christ like she did, then we just have to do our part and we're free to do it. But we know we're doing it together in community, which is another piece that she knew well because of the Catholic worker movement, that, that she wasn't alone in doing that. So I think personalism is really important, but it can too easily shift to individualism, which is a very different thing, which is more about my control than just doing my part. So I was glad that you brought that out because it's that communal sense of the individual. One of the things I do, when I travel around with the film now, I'm doing events all across the country, and uh, I get to visit a lot of the Catholic worker houses around the country. And I talk to the people there, and it seems one of the things that is somewhat different than maybe in the time of Dorothy Day uh, is that fewer and fewer people come into it for the Catholic worker notion. Oh, they come for the social worker notion. They, they see that there's practical ways that you can actually help people. The Catholic notion seems to be less attractive to them. In fact, considerably less attractive to them. <laughs> so how, how do you, how well, do you think... That's a general problem. And what's, what's your sense that will mean down the line in a generation or two after? Well, I, I think this, this sort of life is unsustainable without a deep spiritual practice. You just can't do it. And so whether it's Catholic or Christian or Buddhist, or, you need some deep spiritual roots to be sustained in this radical hospitality. And so I don't think it is doable apart from a deep spiritual sense. But I also know a couple of people who have found in the social work side have led them to the deeper faith. So it goes both ways. It goes both ways. Uh, but the, the fidelity, the challenge to fidelity, if we don't have some deeper sense, roots down deep in the, in the spirit of the divine, I mean, the Holy Spirit, I don't think you can do it. Um, you were right um, in that you were one of the voices, a few voices that said that, <laughs> yes, you know what I'm going to say, yes. that, that said, well, I'm not so sure if she should be canonized, if that's a good thing, and I thank you for the explanation. Uh, but um, you know that she is in the process right now I of being know. canonized. Um, she is, sorry, it's going to happen, probably. It's just a bunch of money to the Vatican. It, it's a I lot of money, to. apparently, to the Vatican. Just to let people know that she was uh, in uh, the year 2000, so 20 years after her passing, she was named a servant of God. And uh, now 20 years since that time, it's 2020, all the materials, everything she ever wrote um, is being collected and uh, interviews with people who lived with Dorothy Day or are still alive and knew Dorothy Day closely are all being, all the documents from all these interviews are all being gathered. They will be soon shipped off to Rome and they'll be curated in Rome for a particular period of time. How long, that remains to be seen. And then one more miracle, one miracle has to be determined. And if that happens, then she will be venerable. And that's the next, that's phase two. And so it's not impossible that Dorothy Day actually may get canonized in my own, our lifetime. And I would find that remarkable, except for the fact that I actually worked with Mother Teresa, 
I did some work with Mother Teresa. I did my first time actually making any filmmaking at all was with Mother Teresa, and she's already been canonized, and uh, as has um, um, John Paul II. I did some work. I, I, I spent a couple of days filming with John. I had the invitation to spend some time with John Paul II. So people that I've actually met and come to know. Are you the common denominator? I am not the common. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I wouldn't mind advancing the cause here. But the, the, the truth of the matter is that it's so remarkable now to think, this is not something I would have ever thought of a generation ago, but to actually know that you would be able to have people that you knew in your lifetime become saints. And here it's possible, I think, Dorothy Day may get very much fast-tracked. There seems to be a lot of momentum behind her canonization. So I don't think it's, it's not surprising to me that it actually might happen for her. But what I found annoying is the ones that were proposing it in the film all seem to be, um, well, not all, but some of them are male clerics who think it's a great idea. And I, I, yeah, I think it's, now, you see. I know, I know, at least it's, well, never mind. Um, but the, the piece that I think is more about, as I understand the political fight around this within the Catholic Church, it's, it's among the hierarchy, it's about prestige and having another saint from my area. And Cardinal Dolan is quite invested in getting another saint in his lifetime from New York. And it's like the craziest competition I could ever imagine. So, and, and, and the fact is, doesn't that move her away from the ordinary folks? Because who of us thinks of ourselves as saints? Lord knows I don't. Just talk to anybody I, I, you know, work with, live with, whatever. But the, the fact of who Dorothy Day is in her complexity, I think is such a gift to us that it's really important to keep the complexity and not make her a stained glass window. But I, I think one of the things that have to be, has to be said is that she is one of the characters who actually studied and revered the life of the saints herself. Oh, absolutely. And one of the people, what I find most interesting is that at the time that Dorothy Day is actually thinking about moving towards Catholicism, the 1920s, in her 20s, in her 20s um, she, she's, she knows about uh, Therese of Lesseur, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the little flower, uh, who had died just a couple of years earlier. And she, so, she read everything by Therese of Lesseur. She so admired her. The whole notion of, you know, a little, even a little pebble in, in, the, in the stream can actually create a rippling effect. And, and Dorothy Day lived that. She actually believed it wasn't about creating big systems. It was about helping individual people any way you possibly could. And Dorothy Day said herself, she wrote in her own diary that, uh, I would like to see Therese of Lesseur become a saint because this way now the whole world will know who mm. she is. So in, in, in my sense, in some kind of a sort of papal justice, <laughs> it, would be, it would be nice to see it come around for Dorothy Day somewhere along the line. Well, that could be. I mean, it could be helpful. I just don't want her, I just don't want her to be an easy saint. Mm -hmm. We're better off being disturbed. I, I, I'm also voting for an, she's an American. Oh. And she's an she's a American woman uh, who you know who sort of came of age during the depression, the Great Depression. That's what sort of a, the Cardinal Dolan argument. Yeah, well, yeah. but I, I think there's something to that. I mean, I, I was with my friend Robert Ellsberg the other day, oh, and I Robert's said, well, how, great. Yeah. how many how many uh, how many Italian saints are there? He says, Oh my God, I couldn't even begin to count. How many French saints? Oh my God, Irish. Oh my God. So I think the Americans could use one more, one, one more interesting American saint. <laughs> and and so. she'd be a good one to and have if that's one. the case. So that the I know that, um, but the other piece is with Robert. I, I've got to say, I know Robert's in favor of this, and, and I count him as a friend, but he worked with her for 12 years. And so, I mean, he's got, he's got the inside scoop, so he knows way more than I. So maybe he's... Maybe I should follow his lead on that. What do you think? I think, uh, Theo, you wanted to open this up to questions, too, to folks. <laughs> you have the hike up there. Uh, can I see you? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, just to continue the conversation, some of the questions were about uh, things you, uh, you touched on. There's one about this thing about private charity versus government responsibility. Um, <clears throat> she talks so much about not waiting for the government, etc. Any more understanding of how she balanced these things and the importance of both caring but 
saying that government does have a role? Did she make a point of arguing for that? You want to do it? Um, I, what I understand is that she thought that the first duty was in that gift of yourself. If the person is there, then you respond to the need, provide the soup. But as I understand where she was, that she didn't believe uh, that government shouldn't do it, but that the first place was individuals and individual responsibility, but it, that somebody in need, the need needed to be met somehow. And so I don't believe, at least in what I've read of her writings, she didn't oppose government program, but she didn't believe they were as effective as that one-to-one, -one, the touch of the heart. And, and that's the piece. What, 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 was, what was the saying? I jotted, hold on a sec. Uh, she talked about the genuine empathy. And her, she knew that genuine empathy comes people to people not organization to organization. And that's what she advocated, but the needs are so big and we don't seem to be responding quite the way to meet those needs, so. I think there's also an historic reality here too, which is especially in the 1930s. Oh my gosh. America was in a terrible shape yeah. and the government was going to have to do something to step up and take some responsibility to help the masses of people. And this is what she really cared most about. She really cared about the tragedy that was happening to the massive number right. of people. I mean, her heart was in socialism. Uh, she sort of leaned toward communism. I'm always careful never to say she was a communist because she was not a communist, but she had socialist leaning. She thought that there was a responsibility by the government to take care of the people, but she was also deeply afraid of the kind of culture and society that we would create if everybody was government dependent. I think that's the thing that she feared also as much. And so ultimately, if it can be handled person to person, that was the best way forward as far as she was concerned. And she, she lived that through to, because the Catholic worker housing I don't know if this is the case for every one of them, but by and large, they're not declared as nonprofits. So they're not even uh, institutionalized. Hmm. There's some of them. Am I correct? Most about of them. That? Most of them are Most, not. But yeah. and so they, it, they're set up so that you're not going into a tax deduction by giving to the Catholic Worker House. Can you imagine that? And they because. But some are. Some are okay. But many of them, many of them aren't, and, and uh, she, she, she did not want that connection. She wanted it to be a gift to the house, to the people, pure and simple, without taking a federal tax deduction. Yeah. I think it also went to the whole idea of not paying federal taxes, not involving yourself in that federal uh, complication. That was a question for you, Martin, just about uh, putting this film together, and how do you go about determining who to have as people to interview. <laughs> yeah, and right. How do you, you know, of all the people that you could ask and talk to, and how do you, in your own mind, put together um, the, the framework for a documentary like this and the people to, to, to have in it? Well, this is my 35th film, and um, hopefully somewhere along the line we'll get, get better at it, I hope. But the, the film becomes an opportunity. I started making these films 35 years ago because um, I care deeply about this kind of material. I want to interview these people. I want to read these books. I want to get involved in these subjects. And, and there's a whole long process that we all go through collectively as a group and talk about the people who could be interviewed and who could bring a certain perspective to the film. Uh, and it also provides me, if I can just say this, an opportunity to meet really cool people like Simone <laughs> and have an opportunity to engage them and talk to them about things that they can become passionate about and so that we can bring them into the film. But for me, it's... It's simply a sense of I arc the film out, I decide what are the topic areas that I want to see in the film, and then we go after the people that we think can help us tell that story the best. And that's as simple as it gets. Cool. There's a question about uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount and the power of the Sermon on the Mount. She mentions that at one point. Do we have any sense, or did you find in your making of the film or things you've heard that that was a particularly powerful, instructive part of the scripture for her? Or, do you, or is that more just because it, it fits with the kind of work she did? Or what, what sense do you have of her own devotional life and the parts of the scripture that were particularly impactful? And was that one of them? Yeah, she actually mentions it herself. The black and white footage that you saw at the beginning of the film was an interview that we found in Ireland. Mm. 
She did an interview, which I thought was one of the best interviews that she had ever done, uh, 1975 in Ireland. And the line was basically to say that, you know, you can read the Sermon on the Mount, and it seems kind of entertaining and, and engaging, but actually living it, putting into practice the Sermon on the Mount, well, that's a matter of conscience that takes it to another level. And uh, that's what I think, that's, that is exactly, I think, what Dorothy Day was all about, Absolutely. fundamentally. And I use the line several times because she raises it herself, the notion of conscience. She always felt, always, uh, that God was haunting her, that God was always there. Even when she hadn't converted to Catholicism, she was talking about God haunting her. That, that, that sense of conscience and responsibility for what's going on here, that was always there, right from the very beginning. So to me, the connection between being haunted by God, a sense of conscience, and then the way to do that was the Beatitudes. Which actually is the, the piece on the Exhortation on Holiness by Pope Francis is what Pope Francis does is set out the Beatitudes as the examination of conscience, that that should be the way we look at, uh, assess our lives. It's against the Beatitudes. It's really challenging. And then there's a final question just about the, this amazing shift she did between being a communist and then becoming such a committed Christian. and. Uh, some things in the film pointed to that. What, what else, is there anything you can add, either of you know, about this shift away from communism? It indicated it was, uh, the move of faith was tied to the birth of her daughter in some ways. Just anything else you could add about that, that shift for her from her early days to her commitment to the, the church and to Christ? Well, I would get in trouble here, I guess, but um, I, I think, again, it's not about communism. It's about the notion that uh, collectively, government has a responsibility for caring for people. It was all really reflecting on how are we going to care for the masses of people that we're responsible to care for. And she, like many people, especially intelligentsia back in the 19 teens and the early 20s, saw, saw socialism really as a, as a possible path forward. So she never really left that. That was something that was always close to her. And to be honest with you, if you read the Beatitudes, if you listen to the, the Catholic social teaching, they're not all that far apart. Because at the heart of it, it's about our response, our shared responsibility for each other, and the fact that we're meant to be community. We're meant to be social creatures, so socialism is about building on the fact that we do this together. It's not about me standing off by myself. It's about us, we, trying to make a way forward where everyone, everyone is fed clothes, cared for, loved, welcomed in that radical hospitality. So I think it was consistent all the way through. And really, when you look at the Catholic faith, that's the ultimate heart of it, is that we're communal, that we're connected, that we belong to each other and we owe a degree of duty to each other. It's a challenge. And religious life is one way to live that out. The Catholic workers another. But the daily life of Christians, of Catholics, is what it's about. Challenging. Uncomfortable at times. But at the heart of it, life. It's life-giving. And just a final question for both of you. Um, if you'd just both briefly answer. what As we close the evening, would you leave us with, uh, Martin, you've been learning about her and making this film about her for some time. And, and of course, Simone, you know about her and have followed in many ways. What brief thought would you leave with us about the message from uh, Dorothy Day for us today, those of us who want to be engaged particularly in uh, social activism for justice and peace? Well, that, that's what I was going to point to. I, the word Catholics come up a lot tonight. We're in, a house of, we're in the Presbyterian <laughs> Church. And I want to be really clear to say that um, that's, one of the, that's one of the remarkable things that's happened in the last number of generations, how people can look at a character like a Dorothy Day and see within her storyline how we're all called. Not, and it, it crosses over the faith, faith divisions, the silos that we put ourselves in in terms of denominations. And look at somebody like this and said, look, she flat out saw Jesus Christ as the model that she was going to live by. The Beatitudes was the, was the direction, the roadmap for her to live her life. And that cuts across every particular particularity within the Christian world. And so I'm delighted that you, Theo, and, and Heather, and everybody would want to have this kind of a film here because I think she does speak to the big picture, which is yeah. that God calls us all to see the face of Christ in the people around us and those who are most in need. 
Amen. I, I, I totally, totally embrace that. And I think she evidenced in her service and in her writing that breadth of welcome. There was never a litmus test on the front door. Do you belong or don't you? Come in, come in. And it's that sense of welcome and wholeness that I think is desperately needed in our time now when we're so polarized, so divided, so torn apart. Maybe if we just take a little spark of tonight's learning of Dorothy Day's life and open our hearts and welcome people in and say, oh, would you like a bowl of soup? Or can I get you a cup of tea? Or how about a cup of coffee? What do you need? But it's that sense of welcome. Couldn't we change our world if we just had a little more welcome and a little less hmm, whatever the other alternative is? Let us pray to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great irony that uh, <laughs> it's a great irony that you're calling it the downtown day service center. Isn't that an interesting thing? Absolutely. Not Absolutely. named after her, but it's it'll help us remember that her, but it just, as we uh, hear it. Just it. Seems to Thank you. If we can have a round of applause for Martin and Sister Ramon. Thank you. Thank you.